We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. perspective, a very brief perspective, on what I think is the topic today from the vantage point of somebody who is a clinical neurologist and a research geneticist. And so that's really where I'm coming from. And hopefully this idea of a continuum will make sense as I go through. So two themes that, that I'd like to uh, present and discuss. Human disorders of cognition and behavior are part of normal human variation. In other words, the human condition. And to understand human brain function, we must understand individual variability. That's the key. So from a geneticist standpoint, this says, for those of you who can't read, because my genetic programming prevents me from stopping to ask directions, that's why. <laughs> now, so those of you who have been in that situation before, you can't blame your spouse. This is genetic programming. Now, of course, we know that that's not true, that um, behavior is a combination of genes and the environment. But genes play a kind of considerable role in all of behavior, as I'll discuss really briefly, as well as brain structure which is what, and function, which is what underlies our behavior. It's the organ that is essential for behavior. So neuropsychiatric disorders are also highly heritable. And so I'm just showing here in a, how prevalent many of these disorders are, even the rarest, like Tourette syndrome, is close to a percent in the population, schizophrenia about a percent, autism a little more than a percent, all the way up to anxiety, which is about 30% uh, you know, uh, general. But if you look at the calculated heritability, which is just an estimate from twin and family studies, all of these disorders have very substantial heritability. And some, on some of them, the error bars are quite large, but they range, none of them are less than 40%, and many of them are, are over 80%. So we really have a group of highly heritable disorders, and the question is, where does that come from? So again, as a neuroscientist and neurologist, as well as a geneticist, so genes interact with the environment during development to lead to cerebral structure. Now, structure is not a static structure. This is a very highly dynamic structure. So we have what we can see, what you can see with imaging or other tools. You have microscopic anatomy. But you also have chemical and molecular plasticity that's ongoing um, virtually constantly. As you're listening to this, it's ongoing. So, and of course, that is what underlies cognitive function. And so, um, and of course, it's not a unidirectional. Development occurs over time, and cognitive function and behavior feeds back on brain structure. So there's a constant iteration of the brain as we develop and as we're exposed to the environment. Now, of course, as we all look around, we can see each other, and we're all highly variable. We're all individuals. We look at each other. There's, we should be able to tell each other all apart from each other most of the time. And so the same thing with the brain. There's an enormous amount of variability in the brain. And here's just one example of that that I found quite interesting from uh, Lawrence Binder. This is the uh, IQ test, the WACE, or it's one of the IQ tests. Forgive me, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm just presenting this. So this is from a paper that he did. And basically, if you go up to 11 or 14 subtests on these different domains that make up IQ, and look at the percentage of people who score 
These are normal people who score in the abnormal range on at least one test, it's 71, and if you go to 14, the more tests, 82% score in the abnormal range. And if you look at three standard deviations, which is really considerably, uh, you know, would be called abnormal in psychoeducational testing, it's almost a quarter when you're doing 14 subtests. So what does that mean? We all have strengths and weaknesses. We kind of know that, but we don't act that way. Our educational system doesn't work that way, and a lot of times that we even discuss, um, you know, our own colleagues, we don't act that way. <laughs> so here's another, uh, here's another point, is that if you look at functional brain networks, which are just kind of color-coded here, things that are interconnected with each other, no brain area really acts alone. They're connected in networks. But if we look at a map of intersubject variability, red being very high, higher, we can see that the areas of highest intersubject variability are those areas that are um, um, kind of uh, the most multimodal, called heteromodal association cortices. These are not the regions that are involved in primary sensation like vision or touch or motor function. These are the places where thoughts come and, your, and, your, um, and the environment is integrated. So that's really a critical issue, is that the, the things that, like the frontal lobe and other circuits that really make us who we are, allow us to plan and really account for a lot of our uniquely human characteristics are the most variable between us. And of course, I mentioned there's a high degree of variability, there's also a high degree of heritability. And this is, again, my genetics viewpoint. Not deterministic, please don't get that idea, but there are two twins. I just find this picture so unbelievably cute. <laughs> Much cuter than the identical twin brains. But the point here is that um, identical twin brains are, are also highly similar, just like twins look similar on the outside. The brain, the structure, the function, highly, highly similar. In fact, most structures in the brain, you know, depending, you know, let's just call it, let's start with the cerebral cortex are, are you know, around 70% to 80% heritability. And this maintains over the lifespan, actually, so it's quite interesting. So then the question is, you know, you know I, I showed you that IQ kind of test that shows that, you know, um, you might have a really high IQ, but the likelihood is you're gonna be really poor in a few areas. And so, you know, let's ex explore that a little bit. Is ability really unidimensional? So the concept of G, or general intelligence, um, this is highly heritable. I think its heritability is around 0.6, so, um, and uh, it's related to many psychoeducational tests. Again, as a neurologist, not as a psychologist, I look at it as things that task working memory and frontal lobe function very strongly, but it doesn't predict many functions. You can have a very high IQ and be bad in certain things. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, again, just like that Binder um, um, table that I showed you, we have to be re really careful when we're looking at, at people um, to really understand strengths and weaknesses, which I think is one of the themes of the discussion that we're going to have today, talking about very unusual strengths. So ability is specific. I'm just going to hammer this in a little bit. This is a, what I think is a spectacular chalk drawing from um, somebody that I don't know well, but I've talked to his mother quite a bit at some times, who's an autistic artist named Jonathan Lerman, who, who is um, a really remarkable artist, and the foreword to this book is written by the New York Times art critic. This is a serious artist, and I have some of his art, and it's very Picasso-esque, it's absolutely brilliant, um, but there are times when he's been absolutely nonverbal and really highly dysfunctional um, and having a lot of problems, but you know, this is not that uncommon. Now, how about me? Like, you know, I'm a relatively smart guy. I have a few degrees. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not up there with the people we're going to be talking about today. I don't have any of those qualities. I'm kind of not exceptional. I'm just a professor. But, um, but I do, um, no, seriously. Um, there's nothing exceptional about that. And, and, and yet at the same time, um, you know, I might be able to do well, you know, I've had to do well in school. And that's because school involves like writing and reading and mathematics, and I can do that. Um, but this is one thing I can't do, and this is not a joke. <laughs> that's my, I've been drawing like that since I was like in third or fourth grade. This is the best I can do. And um, I'm not joking. Now, it's true that I, 
ability is a combination of genes and the environment. So there's no question that I could probably do better if I put my mind to it. Bruce, Bruce Miller believes that I can. Um, I've tried at times, because um, my mom was an artist, and she tried to get me to draw and stuff, and I was really, really bad. But just the point I want to make is that strengths and weaknesses really, um, some strengths come together, they come in groups, um, and we're going to talk about that a lot today. But the point is just because one's strong in one area doesn't mean that you're strong in all areas. And if we had an educational system where I had to represent the world in two or three dimensions, I wouldn't have gotten very far, I'm sure of that. <laughs> so now how does this fit into genetics? Well, this is uh, from Wikimedia Images, one of my main sources. Uh, we use this a lot. Um, it's actually probably from Daniel MacArthur. You know, it's a cartoon from uh, the Broad Group. But um, what you can see here is this is 10,000 BC. This is around where we are right now. This is the estimated population in billions. And you can see that there is an enormous uh, rise, that we were, humans were a very small population. But in the last 10, you know, we essentially have arisen from an ancestral population more than 10,000 years ago. What's interesting is that we come from a small set of ancestors, and that means that the, the, we share common genetic variation that's been acted on by evolution. If those had been very deleterious, anything that's highly deleterious would get removed after thousands of generations. So that the variation that we all share, that is common genetic variation, things greater than 1% in the population, we're 90, our genomes are 99.9% .9 identical. Those things that we share have been acted on by natural selection to remove strong bad actors. And therefore, the things that contribute to most of our human phenotypes, from diabetes to human cognition, have very, each individually have very small effect sizes. And so they haven't been purified. And so when we're looking for genes that cause diseases, a lot of what's going on in genetic association studies is we're looking for relatively high frequency variants that are more than 1% in the population, but they have very small effect sizes, as opposed to mutation screens that identify genes of large effect, but they're generally much rarer. Now, I'm not saying that all human variation is due to common variation, but a good deal of it is. And so we can begin to think, and this is a classic behavior from a behavior genetics textbook from DeFries and and Robert Plama, and I, I, I actually, the W doesn't belong there. Um, there is part of my uh, residual dyslexia from childhood. Um, but complex diseases and disorders and all complex human cognition lies on a continuum of normal variability, a disease threshold model, where we, we get one copy of each gene from mom and one from dad, and uh, this particular variant, if you have the BB variant, uh, you, you're likely to be past a threshold, but it's not deterministic. And think about this as an additive set of normal distributions where these variants of very small effect sizes are adding, adding, adding up. Another point is that the threshold is somewhat arbitrary in many cases. What's high blood pressure? What's high glucose? What's bad reading? What's attention deficit disorder, et cetera? This is all somewhat an arbitrary threshold that's based upon society and what usually, hopefully, what's practical for the biomedical enterprise. So this is the kind of foundation that took me when I started to work on autism about now about 17 years ago to think about autism as part of the continuum of normal variation. And this is the idea. Autism diagnosis depends upon quantitative impairment in multiple domains. It's not qualitative. We all, some people here are really good socially, some aren't. But, but to, to become autistic, you have to fall out here. If you think of each of these as a, as, as, a, as a contour of normal distribution where the green is highly advantageous, really superior functioning, and the red is, is, you know, is less than optimal. And so they have first, children with autism have to have repetitive restrictive behavior and deficits in social behavior. The diagnosis has changed over the last five years so that language is now not fundamentally part of it, but it often is. But just the point here is that, again, a line is drawn and you have to have impairment in multiple domains that's quantitative and measured so that those people that are here who might be a sibling on one area aren't autistic or if they're here. And that's arbitrary again, it's our diagnosis. 
Do we have proof of that? Yes, there's quite a bit of proof. I'm gonna show you one really nice piece of data that was published recently by Elise Robinson and Mark Daly. So social function in those without autism is strongly related to the same genetic factors that increase autism genetic risk. What you can do is you can come up with a composite genetic score, all these little small common risk variants, add them up in what's called a polygenic risk score. And you can ask, if I have that for autism, and it has about a 70% prediction for who's gonna be autistic, how, how well is that correlated with just autism in the normal population? And the normal population being used here is a longitudinal study of parents and children in Avon. It's, it, it's in England. It's called ALSPAC. And if you look, you can see that the genetic correlation between um, the Psychiatric Genetic Consortium Autism and a Danish Autism Consortium are both close to 0.3. That's an enormous correlation. So that's telling us that the things that, in the common variation that we have that predisposes to autism is part of normal variation. So how about other things? How about other, and you're gonna hear a lot more about some of these topics today, but I just wanted to touch on them and give you a point of view, maybe a framework. So there's something called synesthesia, and this is a slide from my colleague, Simon Baron Cohn, who would have given a much better talk than I'm giving, but, um, and unfortunately can't be here. But s stimulation of one sensory modality automatically triggers a perception in a second. So it might be that, you, that you, when you see a word, you hear music with it, or vice versa. When you hear music, there's a color associated with it. It's actually present in some degree or another in 4% of the population. It also has a strong genetic, um, there's evidence that it you know, has, has genetic uh, um, factors. So about almost 40% have at least one other family member with synesthesia. And there's been some evidence of genetic linkage even, but no genes have been identified as far as I'm aware, but maybe si um, Simon knows or Simon Fisher. So now I'm gonna tell you just a brief bit about, about somebody that Simon Baron Cohn knows quite well, which is Daniel Tammet, and many of you may have read his book, Born on a Blue Day. If you haven't read it, you must read it. It, it is an extraordinary book. Um, there, you know, you, if you haven't read it, you wouldn't believe that, so, that there's a, you know, somebody who can do this, but he sees numbers of shapes and colors. This test of genuineness is a test that, uh, that is related to synesthesia. He's invented his own language. He learns languages in two weeks. I think he learned Finnish in two weeks, perfectly. Uh, he performs mathematical calculations that you can't imagine. He um, is the European champion in pi to 22,515. And he has Asperger's syndrome. So the question is, so okay, so that's an interesting observation. That's a, a very rare, unique individual with these features. So you can ask the question, does autism, is synesthesia increased in people with autism? So if independent, synesthesia and autism should co-occur in four out of 10,000 people because of the, but they're not. Simon Baron Cohn's study shows that it's present in almost 19%. Of course, this is done via questionnaire, so it would have to be redone measuring it, but I think one would argue that it's quite uh, enriched. Also, there's also an enrichment among those who have a perfect pitch with synesthesia. I think about 20, you know, in this study, about 20%. So there's a relationship of some of the things that we're gonna be talking about today that are really extraordinary variations on the human mind and uh, common genetic variation and what we think of as intellectual or behavioral disabilities or disorders. And so I'll leave you with one thought. What does it mean that a feature that is present rarely in the general population is more frequent in those with a disorder? I mean, of course, it means that the human condition is one of strengths and weaknesses, and that great, great strength can be the flip side of disability. And in part, this is because of the genetic contributions to evolution, to human brain evolution, that we've inherited strengths along with weaknesses, and sometimes they lead to what we call a disorder. And I'm gonna leave you with another interesting thought, that if you look at the most variable brain regions in human, there are also those that have expanded most on the human lineage, getting back to one of my earliest slides. Again, this is from a paper, Mueller et al. in Neuron in 2013. And basically, if you look at the cortical surface expansion in this frontal, parietal, temporal lobe area, and then you look at the areas of the most intersubject variability, there it is. And we know that cortical surface volume, especially volume, is highly heritable. So that this variability is highly heritable as well. 
And you can look at this correlation. You know, there's a, a strong correlation throughout, not just in my picture. So we've had 150 years in behavioral neurology of learning from the individual, from Tan, who was Broca's first patient, and from seeing two patients, he reasoned that language was in the frontal lobes. Well, maybe that was a little too specific. Wernicke helped him out a little bit. But, but he reasoned that the cerebral cortex was therefore asymmetric and that language was on one side. And here's another patient, patient HM, who was one of a series of patients who had bilateral hippocampal damage and led to our, you know, played important roles in our understanding of memory. So again, I want to say that we must lear learn, um, you know, to continue to understand the nature of individual differences and how uh, disease, what we call disease and disorders, is really just part of the human condition. And these exceptional variations are often strongly associated with vulnerabilities. Thank you.